Thank you, everyone. It's, it's very nice that you all came out. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to see you all here. Um, just as, as a show of hands, uh, there's no right answers or wrong answers. Just for my information, helps me kind of frame things a little different. How many of you know what National Public Radio is or NPR in the United States? Well, roughly a dozen, so. And, and how many of you have uh, um, uh, listened here in Berlin to our station 1041? Not many of you. Uh, there's two of you, three, four, four, that's what I said. See, it's an opportunity for you to, uh, to, uh, uh, to listen into um, uh, NPR, and uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be a little bit more intrigued about hearing some of the things that we offer. So I'm going to share four things with you about NPR Public Radio in the United States and NPR Berlin. Uh, the first thing is something that surprises many people, many Europeans, is NPR is not a state broadcaster. It's not like uh, the BBC or German Public Radio or, or uh, the CBC in Canada. It is uh, America, U.S. does not have a state broadcaster. We have Voice of America, which is more, more of a, 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 a PR arm for the U.S. government. It is not an, an independent um, uh, journalism organization. So uh, we do not receive a tax subsidy like, man, like many governments do in Europe to provide for public radio, nor do we own and operate any radio stations. And something that could be described as quite American, all uh, of our member stations, all 800 of them, are all independently owned and controlled and operated in the communities in which they exist. Uh, instead of a tax subsidy, NPR receives uh, funding from corporate sponsors. Uh, we also get grants and institutional funds and fees paid by our member stations to license the programming that we produce, and they choose to air when they want to air it. The money for those carriage fees come from individual lis listener donations. 3.6 million people in the United States every year make a contribution to their local NPR station. NPR, compared to other uh, uh, major broadcast organizations, is fairly young. We, um, uh, uh, we're only 42 years old. Uh, broadcasting, as you know, radio broadcasting um, has, been, uh, has been around for almost a century. Uh, in the 1920s, a lot of educational institutions in the United States uh, got radio station licenses and ran educational programming, classical music, other things that were considered non-commercial at the time and educational. And um, in the 1940s, the FCC, which controls radio broadcasting in the United States like the MABB does here, um, uh, decided that uh, uh, we would take all these these FM or these these educational stations and put them on the FM because at the time nobody cared about FM at all. No one was, AM was the dominant uh, form in, in, in uh, uh, of radio broadcasting and FM was kind of considered a wasteland. Then in the 1940s and 50s, after the advent of television, uh, most radio production in the United States and, and around the world really switched to being much more music focused and FM with a higher fidelity all of a sudden became um, a really desirable thing. So we ended up, uh, you know, public radio in the United States did not uh, go to where the audience was. The audience kind of came to FM where we were. So then you started to see this growth of interest in public radio and what its potential could be. In 1967, uh, the US Congress passed the Public Broadcasting Act, which was signed by Lyndon Johnson, to uh, establish, to kind of codify that there should be something in the United States called public radio, and to fund it with a very, very small amount of money that continues to this day from the US government, which goes from the government to all the stations. NPR doesn't receive direct support from the US government. Uh, uh, the individual stations are all given, and, and I think the, the amount of, of funding that CPB gets every year for all public radio and public television is a fraction of a fraction of 1% of the US government budget. It's a very, very, very small amount. Um, and so uh, the mandate given by Congress through the Public Broadcasting Act was to, was to create uh, uh, public broadcasting to the growth and development of non-commercial radio to develop programming that would be responsive to the interests of people, basically saying to put uh, the quality of the programming ahead of the profits that could potentially be drawn from the use of a radio station license. So in February of 1970, uh, 90 stations kind of gathered together and chartered national public radio, figuring that they would need some sort of national news presence in order to uh, um, uh, serve all these public radio stations. And NPR was founded at that time. Uh, a little over a year later, in April of 1971, NPR's first broadcast was reporting on the U.S. Senate hearings about the war in Vietnam. 
Less than a month later, NPR debuted its first weekday news magazine called All Things Considered, which you hear here in Berlin in the morning, uh, marking NPR as a national news producer. So since uh, the second thing I want to tell you is that NPR, uh, if you haven't heard of it, is the leading radio news source in the entire United States, commercial or non-commercial. What we've grown to today from those humble roots. Uh, when we started with 90 member stations, now we have more than 800, covering 93% of the U.S. population. NPR and its member stations touch the lives of millions of people every day, informing public life and discourse, enriching culture, and helping people understand events and ideas. Uh, to show an example of the power of national public radio, just a week or, week or so ago, we did a, a series of stories on grain mills and the people who work in them in the United States, which if, uh, if, if please don't uh, allow me to insult you by telling you this, but um, you know the grain is often stored in large, large silos, and there are people who work uh, those silos to fill them and empty them. Occasionally, uh, they get jammed full of grain, and they send someone in to uh, clear it out and many, many times those people uh, uh, are, are killed or are, uh, are suffer injury as a result of doing that work which they were forced to go do. Um, NPR airs this series of stories and started being discussed in Congress that same week and legislation is now pending to put uh, better controls over the working conditions of those people. So within the course of just a matter of two weeks, we've, uh, we've surfaced a story that uh, had a profound impact because when NPR talked about these stories, millions of people heard them, started to contact their representatives in Congress, and action came very, very quickly afterwards. So uh, uh, NPR also has a very unique editorial voice for a news organization. It's uh, trustworthy, independent journalism, regarded by audience and our peers and media as the standard of broadcast journalism in, in, the, United, in the United States. We have national and international coverage, thoughtful analysis, features uh, that we do uh, about stories, commentaries. NPR not only reports what is happening, but what is unique to us is we dig into why things happen and what it means to people in their lives. We dive deep into stories and we dare to listen to the people in the stories and share their stories more broadly. NPR and, and stations uh, reflect a commitment to balance and independent journalism. That's why we have this weird system set up around us and how we, uh, how we operate. We're committed to civil, uh, civil dialogue and respect for our audience. They aren't just people we gather together to sell advertising. We don't sell advertising. We bring people together because we want to illuminate stories and affect people's lives. We produce a total of 29 different programs from Morning Edition, which is our morning program, which airs in the middle of the afternoon uh, here in Berlin, All Things Considered, uh, then a variety of entertainment and information programs, including some of our new programs, which we've just debuted this year, uh, that are heard on weekends here on NPR Berlin, uh, Ask Me Another, which is an hour of puzzles, word games, and trivia, and the TED Radio Hour, which where we partner with uh, Ted, the people who produce TED Talks that you see on the internet, to um, uh, create an hour radio experience, which is which is kind of um, uh, amazing to hear it. Uh, in a time when most traditional media in the United States has seen declines in its audience while the while the digital revolution and revolution is happening, um, in the past ten years, NPR and its member stations have seen an unparalleled rate of growth. Currently, there are 34.2 million people who listen to public radio NPR stations in the United States every week. And that's compared to just uh, in 2002, that number was 27 million. That's more than the combined circulations of the top 114 newspapers in the United States combined, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and Washington Post. We have 350 reporters, correspondents, and newscasters. In addition to that, we have the new access to the newsroom at all 800 of our radio stations. So we have a, a news force, a news gathering force, which is unparalleled in broadcast journalism in the United States. We can cover all aspects of news, from in-depth coverage to headlines uh, around major stories, breaking news, as we have seen in the past 12 hours, uh, 24 hours. I've kind of lost track of time, to be quite honest, uh, with the events of the Boston Marathon. Um, we have specialty beats from the people who specialize in, in deep knowledge and matters from uh, the Supreme Court to uh, and, and uh, um, um, health, science. Uh, even within science, we have a, an entire crew of people specializing in different aspects of that topic. And we try to cover things that are comfortable and controversial and do all of them with a degree of fairness, context, and editorial independence. Obviously, a very, very important thing to us. 
We just ordered it, opened a new uh, 440,000 square foot headquarters in Washington, D.C., uh, which, is, which has been a very exciting process to see NPR's new home be built and, and open up. Our first major broadcast scheduled for yesterday afternoon and an hour and a half before we went to air, the Boston uh, the Marathon bombings happened and it was throw out the rule book. We're not even sure where the coffee machine is, where the bathrooms are, but we have we are needed right now. And they went until uh, um, until about uh, 10 p.m. last night. So for about eight solid hours in a facility that they hadn't used before, um, and and delivered uh, uh, important coverage for people throughout the United States, and here in Berlin too. We uh, we have 17 domestic bureaus inside the United States, reporters stationed around the country to work not only uh, covering breaking news stories like we had in Boston uh, yesterday, but to work with our member stations to coordinate their coverage. Um, we also have 17 international bureaus as well, from Mexico City to here in Berlin. Uh, we have Shanghai, Dakar. We have um, uh, not only to cover the politics of uh, and, and, and lives of people here in Berlin, but the people then also look at the, the region um, as a whole, and we can move them around where, where we feel we need them. We have a number of permanent um, uh, Middle Eastern bureaus in Istanbul, uh, uh, Islamabad, Kabul, Beirut, and um, Jerusalem. And as I briefly mentioned earlier, public radio is also one of the United States's greatest success stories for philanthropic and public support. Uh, millions of listeners, 3.6 3 million listeners and donors, along with universities, corporate sponsors, foundations, federal, state, and local governments, all contribute to a healthy and diversified pool of revenue to make this operation work. Individual contributions make up public radio's biggest source of revenue, oddly, and this is a very unique concept for people in other parts of the world to understand that that listeners would voluntarily contribute money. This is not a tax. Uh, they, we basically go on the air several times a year. We don't, our stations do, ask for contributions. And about one out of every 10 people actually give up some, some, some coin for it, which is very uh, uh, rewarding to know that even in a world where they can listen for free, they choose to contribute. Uh, NPR has also been a very aggressive player in digital platforms as well. Our, our saying is that we don't believe that radio is going away in the future. We believe it's going everywhere. That radio is no longer a technology with FM broadcasting, but radio is an experience where you can listen to it on your smartphone. Last night I was listening on my iPad while I was trying to monitor events back in Boston and, and how our stations were doing. Um, and uh, the, the radio really is no longer just a, a stick. It's very interesting. If you look at um, many of you, I'm sure, have iTunes on your computers. Before the most recent upgrade, there was a little radio tab in, in iTunes, and the little icon for it was a tower with little beams coming out of it. But if you looked at any of the organizations or, or people uh, offering radio services in that list, very few of them were brick and mortar radio stations. Most were people setting up an internet stream about hip hop in their in their basement or or a bunch of people coming together trying to with a startup trying to create um, a music service. Very few of them uh, are, are radio stations and almost all of the ones that are radio stations were our public radio stations. So uh, we believe that as technology moves forward in the future, we want to have that radio experience of being able to hear a human voice and understand someone's story uh, that you experience on an FM radio, that we're able to share that regardless of what the platform is. One of the beautiful things about radio is it removes the visual medium, which if you hear someone being interviewed, you know, if you see someone, you, you, I don't care who you are, you immediately judge them by what you see. You see their hair, you see their clothes, you see the way they present themselves, and you say, you, you can't help but form some sort of judgment on that. Radio has the great equalizing factor of being able to take that away, and all you hear is what they say, or all you experience is what they say. A very common phrase that we hear people often say is when you're on television, someone will say to you, oh, I saw you on television. But when you're on radio, people talk about what you said, which is a big difference. So uh, we've had a lot of success in digital platforms. Um, NPR.org serves 19 million unique visitors a month. Uh, we have 2.5 million followers on Facebook, uh, a very, very similarly large number on Twitter. Um, more than 9 million people have downloaded the apps to listen to NPR programming on iPod, 
uh, or iPads, um, iPhones, and Android devices, 9 million. And podcasts, so you, you look like a generation that would know what podcasts are. Um, I was just speaking to a, shall we say, a little bit older organization yesterday, and none of them had any idea what it was. Um, so podcasts, we serve 28 million podcasts a month to people all around the world. And, and uh, the third thing I want to tell you about is about NPR Berlin which is that NPR Berlin is a very unique service to us, and it really is a matter of when opportunity knocks, being there to listen and to respond. NPR Berlin went on the air on April 1st, 2006, and is the only NPR-owned uh, radio operation in the entire world. Like I said, all of, our other, all of our affiliates in the United States are independent organizations that subscribe to and license our programming. NPR Berlin is the only radio station we own. There is no NPR Rome, no NPR London, no NPR Paris. There is only one, and it's here in Berlin. And how did all this happen, you might wonder. Why Berlin? Well, there's a couple of very good reasons why Berlin made sense. The concentration of English language, uh, English-speaking people in a concentrated area uh, is one of them. How, the tech, how uh, oddly, the way that um, radio stations are licensed and operated here in Berlin allowed us to set it up the way we do, which is uh, rather odd. Um, so Opportunity knocked, uh, and uh, as some of you may know, under German media law, uh, after the wall came down, each of the Allied powers were given or were told they would be given an uh, FM radio frequency. Um, Voice of America had had a frequency for a number of years, but really wasn't using it very well. And when it came up for renewal, we, along with about two dozen other people, put in um, uh, proposals of what we would do with that frequency. And NPR was the one that was chosen to be given the. The, to be given the frequency, and it's been going so well that it just absolutely slid through its renewal process, and we're about two weeks into our second license period. We expected it to take many, many months and a lot of meetings, and we basically said we want to renew it, and they immediately said yes. Um, uh, it's, it's very strange uh, uh, because there's no physical location in Berlin for NPR Berlin. The feed comes directly from Washington, D.C. to the transmitter site here in Berlin. We operate the entire station from Washington, D.C., which is, which is kind of odd and fun in a number of ways. Um, there are no full-time employees of NPR Berlin in Berlin. We have a number of staffers um, based in Washington, D.C. who do work on the operation of it. And uh, we do uh, fortunately have a number of, of, of local freelancers who, uh, who produce uh, amazing uh, pieces for us that we do include in the service. Um, it is uh, interesting that the, in my group, the programming group in Washington, uh, the most coveted job that people want is the NPR Berlin weatherman because we do the weather <laughs> forecasts, and and uh, uh, one gentleman uh, did it pretty much when we decided to start doing it, and he loved doing this. It was he would just take a couple minutes every day to record the the weather forecasts that would be inserted into the service, and but you could stop him in the hallway and you say, Arnie, what's the weather going to be like in Berlin today? He's like, it's nine degrees, it's partly sunny, but a uh, chance it'll get warmer later on in the day, and he would. Uh, and he just loved doing that. When he uh, he was actually hired uh, to help us cover the Obama campaign, but he refused to give up doing the Berlin weather forecast. And wherever he was in the country covering the, the campaign, he would still uh, produce and record his weather forecast and and turn it in electronically. So uh, and and uh, he has since moved on. But it when it was quite a competition to see who would get to be NPR Berlin weatherman. Um, even on Arnie's Facebook page, it still says. NPR political producer and weatherman. <laughs> so, oddly, for those of you who have listened to the service before, you may notice that we also do, where we solicit for, in the United States, how we solicit for donations locally in those markets that air our programming. We have done so here in NPR Berlin, and uh, I have participated in those fund drives. Um, when we fundraise during morning drive, which is traditionally a very uh, heavy time of listening for radio. Um, that morning drive is midnight to 2 a.m. in Washington, D.C. So because it was my bright idea to fundraise during that time, I'm one of the people that gets to come back to work at midnight and talk to you and wish you good morning while it's, I'm just like, oh, it's it's one in the morning. I'm a little tired. And I've, I've forbidden anyone from drinking before they go and do it because I just want to be, I don't think anyone's going to give us any money if a bunch of drunks are on the air asking for their contributions. Uh, and, and we would like to uh, expand the service we provide uh, to current international audiences, but because it's such a unique situation here in uh, Berlin, we, continue, we, we want to continue to build up NPR Berlin, but see a lot of our future expansion being digital. 
uh, throughout the rest of the world. So it's more than likely this is going to maintain uh, being a very unique opportunity for NPR and for listeners here. Um, in addition to providing National Public Radio's U.S. programming here to um, uh, in, in Berlin, we produce a number of, of elements in, uh, with a partnership with a number of local, uh, locally based producers. The Life in Berlin series, um, Berlin Stories, Berlin Journal. We um, do, uh, uh, do a lot of event recording with the American Academy and here at ICD uh, to broadcast these uh, uh, programs out uh, to listeners and they've been very, very successful. We have our beloved weather forecast, a daily event calendar and a blog and um, website to support the entire things and help uh, listeners kind of navigate what we have available. And the fourth thing I would also mention to you is that NPR Berlin does need your help. Um, it is uh, a great source of English language programming, a great insight into the world of the United States. There's some really entertaining stuff on the weekends. Um, and so we would like uh, to, 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 uh, to welcome you to being a listener. You're also welcome to make a contribution to help us support it if you wish. Uh, I won't give you a pitch now, but we are, uh, we are looking at forming even more organizations here in Berlin because I'm, I'm, I'm a believer, uh, I, you know, I, I worked at radio stations for many years before I came to the national organization. And one of the things that radio does very well is it builds community. It doesn't matter if it's in Kenya or Kansas um, or Berlin or Washington, D.C., that radio really has a way of bringing a community together, people who are interested in a certain type of programming or a certain perspective, a certain type of music. It brings them together and, and, and kind of gives them some kind of like... Um, kind of connecting glue to, to unite them. And a radio station's responsibility is then is to reflect that voice back out to that people. Um, so it's not just a one-way funnel from uh, Washington, D.C. to NPR or Berlin, but that there should be a chance for that community of NPR Berlin voices to then surface back up on that radio uh, station. And that's uh, what our goal is for the coming years, is to kind of grow that and, and maintain it. So um, I hope you'll, if you, for the, for the several of you who do listen, I hope you'll conti continue to. And um, for the rest of you, I hope you will uh, uh, take an opportunity to, uh, to check it out and to listen. It's, uh, I, I, I won't guarantee that you will uh, in, enjoy it, but I'm, I'm pretty certain you will. So uh, if you have any questions about how NPR operates or some of our news coverage or programming, I'd be happy to entertain them. We're about NPR Berlin. Otherwise, are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Eric Nutum. Uh, I guess it's time for questions. Uh, do you guys have any? Anyone has any question here? Okay, please introduce. Yeah. All right. My name is Cade, and I'm a master's student here at the ICD, and I'm from Iowa. Ah. And I listen to NPR back home. Uh, actually I actually didn't know radio. there was one in Berlin, so to check uh -huh. it out, definitely. Um, 1041. Yep. It should be up there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I see it. <laughs> All right. So yeah, my kind of question, um, it's a pretty recent comment and uh, thing that happened. The, the, you mentioned the Boston bombing mm -hmm. yesterday. And I noticed that was like the main headline on almost every news website that I saw. I mean, even on TV, everything. And... It seems to happen a lot when really bad things happen or big news events happen that one will overshadow everything else that may be even bigger, but mm -hmm. just not like, I mean, the United States, it seemed like a big deal, it's a big event. Um, but in Iraq, there was the tons of bombings there, a bunch of people died, many wounded. Also in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. a wedding got bombed by the US by accident. Mm -hmm. Things like this, which you can see on CNN that much. Um, and does NPR, I mean, you guys been ever like, do you ever take any actions to kind of try to bring up not focus so much on one issue or try to really incorporate everything? And do you think there's anything that could be done to help that? I know it's inevitable in some ways to where these big events will do that, but it seems kind of, I mean, being by the news a lot. So, I mean, I'm just kind of curious what your opinion was on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, it's a great, great uh, observation. Um, it, it is an interesting balance between providing uh, a service that gives people what they want and being reflective of their needs and also realizing that those needs ebb and flow and change. Um, one, of the, the, one of the reasons I was monitoring events and participating via phone after you know, yesterday evening as this, this story was unfolding is it's a really hard balance to figure out how much is enough, especially in a situation like yesterday when a lot of misinformation is going out, um, a lot of things had to be retracted because they were the, the, the organization said them, then they had to pull it back. There's such a rush to be first 
and at NPR, we try to rush to be right. So we will often kind of hold back on, on not necessarily jumping into the fray of the wall-to-wall -wall blowout, only one story all day coverage, which is what a lot of news organizations do. And frankly, there are people amongst our own stations who feel we should be doing more of that. We feel resistant to that for a couple reasons. One, there's not a lot to say that you know is true. One of the things I'm most proud of, of yesterday is despite all the challenges we had yesterday in reporting that story of being in a new facility, things aren't quite working the way they're supposed to be, people are unfamiliar, we didn't say anything on the air we had to take back. No. Um, we'd rather wait a couple extra minutes so that people who are listening on Iowa Public Radio know that what they're hearing is true. So that's the first part. That's the real challenge in that story, is not only understanding um, how, how to cover it relative to other stories, but how to cover it, sometimes things can be overblown. And you're making, you know, if you look at, for example, a lot of the US um, news channels, CNN, when they're covering, when they're airing it he here in, in the American form, Fox News, which probably some of you know, um, anytime, you know, a, a screw comes loose, it's breaking news. It's like this big, 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 big event. And we really try hard to not be too tempted by that. The, uh, and, and so we try to offer a balance until we reach a point with events like yesterday where there is no point in talking about anything else. People, including myself, I had a friend who was running in the Boston Marathon yesterday, and I'm trying to find out what's going on. I want to know how, how things are going. And oftentimes, that broadcast information is the only update you get. So in that situation, even if there are only a small number of facts, we just say them over and over and over and over again, just so people who are tuning in at that moment have the information they need. Um, a, a very important uh, uh, point you bring up very early in your question was about balancing the, you know, I don't want to be, be crass here, but the three people who died and the hundred that were injured in Boston and looking at the relative coverage of that compared to other incidents elsewhere in the world, um, that is a very, very difficult balance. I think NPR really strives to bring forward stories that others may not miss or may not cover um, because they aren't as sensational. Um, it's a little unfair when you have a domestic uh, event compared to an international event. Um, as unfair as it seems, people are always more interested in something that's closer to home, or in the case in the United States, where you may know someone who's there at that major event. Um, so it is a balancing act, but uh, we strive to, to, to tell stories a little differently. We don't tell stories uh, um, internationally, international news, because that's the right thing to do. We tell them because they're good stories and they're important stories and you understand uh, the plight of a person much better when it's not uh, fed to you as broccoli, but when you're, you're given an opportunity to understand that person's life. And that's the perspective we take. We don't tell you how to think. We present you with the impact of what's going on and, and you can decide how to think. And um, unfortunately, it, it, it is impossible in the linear world of radio broadcasting to give equal weight to every story, or else you would, you would, you know, it it would be impenetrable. You would have to listen. We'd have to talk twenty four hours a day, and you'd have to listen twenty four hours a day. So we try to come up with a mixture of programming that both satisfies people's immediate needs to know what's going on in the world, and to surface things that they might otherwise have missed that we were able to illuminate and share with them. So that's a long winded answer to your question. I promise other answers won't be so long. <laughs> other questions? You know, it's Darnell Summers. Uh, I'm also a journalist. You know, and I found out rather late last night that this event had happened in Boston. What I did recognize is that there were several stories out here. Mm -hmm. I actually witnessed people saying that there were two bombs and then there were three and then we were back to two and then there... Uh, there was just a fire, a mechanical failure at the JFK library. Also, you, you said yourself that, well, you want to get it right. You know, well, if you go back to 911, I think it's sort of like the same scenario existed mm -hmm. where the press was just fed information and they reported it. And that became the narrative. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't buy it then, I don't buy it now. But seeing this particular situation unfold, I have a lot of questions, but as a journalist, I want to know who knew, who knew what and when. Mm -hmm. That's a very important thing to know. There, are, there seems to be a case where people are saying there could have been some forewarning here. Mm -hmm. That's a serious story. Mm -hmm. 
uh, one question is, would your organization follow that up? Do you, would you see a responsibility to delve into the question of whether or not there was forewarning of this and whether or not people just laid back and let things develop or didn't take it seriously or what have you? That's very serious. Mm -hmm. um, I have some criticisms of NPR. Mm -hmm. With two and a half million people in prison in America, I think we should have a daily show on that, on the suffering of people and how that impacts on our nation and on the respective communities. Mm -hmm. You know, what, 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 you know, and by the way, I've been listening to NPR since the beginning. I'm a Vietnam veteran, so you know how long I've been listening since the very first day. I often thought that, and a lot of people were on the impression that national public radio meant that the government was somehow involved in allowing airtime for people to express their views without any government hindrance, but actually funding it. Mm -hmm. That was my understanding for a long time, and perhaps people are still, nonetheless, under that impression, mm -hmm. NPR. So I said that to say that people actually attach a certain responsibility to NPR. Mm -hmm. You know, as being genuine news, objective, mm -hmm. truthful, searching for the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and the, the NPR does uh, have a long track record of asking difficult questions on stories. Um, something that pops to mind. And, and, and not only do we ask difficult questions, but we don't lose interest in the stories as quickly as, as many other media organizations do. Uh, for example, several years ago with the collapses of, uh, in the mines in West Virginia, which you may remember that story, uh, NPR not only was probably the last major news organization still reporting on that, but we've gone back many times to look at what was learned from that, how conditions changed, what was the outcome from that story? Were people, are conditions any better for miners now than they were before those collapses happened? And those are some incredibly powerful interests in the United States, and we are we believe in holding uh, holding those uh, uh, those in power up to uh, up to a light to make sure that their actions are are and, and accountabilities are, are appropriately appropriately uh, shared. So um, uh, you know uh, there are people who. Um, are passionate about many uh, different issues, who uh, do criticize us, rightfully. We deserve, we, are, we, are, we aspire to be a major part of American civil life, and uh, therefore we have to be pretty thick-skinned and listen to uh, sometimes some difficult feedback from people. Um, uh, but we try to do our best, and we try to do our best to be beholden to the ones who's paying our bills, which is our listeners. Any other questions? I think we had a question in the front. No? <laughs> My name is Anushka Perlman and I write for NPR. I'm the music correspondent over here in Berlin. It's a pleasure to hear you and see you here. Um, I do have a question. I hope it's not insensitive, but I'm always wondering, when NPR is sponsored also by corporations, mm -hmm. is there any expectation from the corporation on, in any way that can influence or affect the programming st of the stories? Does, that, does it play any kind of role in influencing the programming? Um, it, it, and the short answer is it does not. Um, I'll explain it in a little bit more detail. Um, sometimes the firewall between how we raise money and how we conduct our journalism is so thick that we step on our own feet sometimes. An example being, um, well, you see, that when we're putting together the programs, for those of you who have not listened to public radio in the United States, you will hear you know, 20 minutes of a program, then about 30 seconds of acknowledgments of, of, of corporate sponsors who are, and they'll say their name and often a corporate slogan, um, just to acknowledge that they've been a supporter. We're actually required by law to do that. It's also in a, uh, a, an organization like ours believe very deeply in transparency. Uh, that's a, a obviously a, a way of, of demonstrating that. Um, uh, we have had on a handful of occasions over the years where we're covering, doing a very unflattering story about an organization or a company, and then the, the, the credits come up, and they're in those corporate credits. And it causes people to kind of question, like, well, wait a minute, you're reporting on Monsanto, and then Monsanto is a sponsor? How does that work? How can you tell me that those that corporation does not exert influence? The way they don't is there's there's that thick firewall that separates off the two sides of our organization. So the people producing that show, airing that Monsanto story, didn't even know that that credit existed. And the people who were creating the credit 
didn't know that the Monsanto story was being done. They're kind of kept, it's the one part of our organization that is distinctly not transparent, where we try to keep those very separate. Um, you know, on another occasion, we had a situation where we did a movie review, and then, a, then the uh, distributor, Universal Studios or whatever, the movie was acknowledged in the credits, and people rightly asked us questions and hold, held us to account for that, and uh, obviously it was just a, just a mistake. But uh, I'd rather deal with those when they happen than to not have that firewall between how our editorial decisions are made and how we're funded. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, NPR's budget is, uh, yearly is roughly about $170 million. We receive about $40 million of that from corporate sponsorships. Again, it's even legally a separate organization that sells and sells those sponsorships. It's not even technically part of NPR. Um, we do that again just to keep that business completely discreet from our journalism. Thank you very much because that's actually the question I always get here in Berlin from mm -hmm. people and I've never quite known how, I, of course I've said no, no, of course not, but then I've always wondered if there's... Yeah, it's even a, no. technically a separate company with separate okay. employees who sell that stuff just because we want to make sure that that's... There's not, it's very difficult because also NPR does lobbying on behalf of its member stations. Mm -hmm. um, for example, when uh, FCC regulations or laws are being reconsidered, NPR is NPR is not a network; it's a member organization. All of our stations are members. It's kind of like, you know, uh, like a local gym or something like that, right? And um, so, which is that's why we don't dictate programming to stations. They hear what they want when they want. Um, uh, we also represent them on Capitol Hill, and that's a very strange relationship for a broadcaster to also have that role. And so we've been considering how to kind of firewall off that too. Because obviously we cover Congress too. Thank you. So, other questions? Uh, hello, thank hello. you for being here first. Uh, my name is Margot, I come from France. And mm -hmm. uh, I would just have a, a question about the coverage of international news mm -hmm. because like you, you mentioned that you had like at the NPR many reporters that were trying to investigate to know the how and the why of a situation and uh, I guess you're very aware of this but like there's been many critiques concerning the coverage of uh, in particular co um, international news mm -hmm. with this relentless race uh, to the toward the breaking news and many um, news broadcasting channels um, taking their informations from the same sources meaning like the some leading uh, news agencies so I would just like to, to know what's your opinion of, on this and, mm -hmm. and how far NPR would be concerned on this matter. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for that question. It's a, it's a, it's a struggle. I wish it was easy to say that it's always easy to, uh, um, uh, it's always easy to uh, to manage that. But it's a, it's a constant struggle. Uh, NPR has very high standards for what we're willing to report on air. Everything has to have multiple sources to it. So rarely are we in a situation where we have, uh, we're taking a fact from one source and just parroting it back. It, unfortunately, there are situations where there is only one source or that source is the only ready, uh, available source of information. In those situations, we will identify where we are getting the information from according to sources in the Pentagon or according to um, you know, the Boston police. If, if that's the only source we have, we will, we will share that so it's, it's apparent to people how we are getting our information and then they can judge according to their own standards of truth, whether that's something they're willing to accept or whether they wish, before they kind of consider that a fact, whether they want to see it verified from other sources. I think it's, um, again, it kind of also goes into the we don't necessarily want to uh, tell people how to think. We're going to provide them with information. We try to do so transparently so they'll know how we're getting our information. Uh, but if we just say, if we say the sky is blue, we talk to three people who said, yeah, that's, that color's blue. That's just the way that we operate. Um, and when we're not in that situation, we try to be clear about how that's done. Um, uh, I, another way that we try to avoid that is by sending our people in wherever we possibly can. Um, we have a number of journalists who take um, uh, uh, um, a large amount of risk, degree of risk, to put themselves in places where other journalists don't go. Um, a perfect example is inside of Syria or inside of Libya, where those are dangerous places. Dangerous, dangerous places. Um, when events were happening in Libya, for example, um, we had a number of, of reporters who hired local drivers, went, drove across the border, and walked to get to the places where they covered. 
and reported along the road, reported the lives of the people they found, the streams of refugees they saw coming outside of Libya, that these, are, these were stories that there was, not, there was no other Westerners, there were no other journalists. It was them out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I, one of our, our hosts, Scott Simon, who has been DC based for a number of years, uh, tells me of what that, that process was like back in the days when they didn't have the technology we did now. They would travel with a s small satellite dish. And he went, um, um, uh, he was um, uh, in, in, in um, uh, reporting from a war, uh, uh, war in uh, Serbia, uh, former Yugoslavia. And um, there was a, um, a um, number of times that he would set up the satellite dish, talk into the, sat into the, into the equipment, and had no idea if anyone ever even heard it. He was just kind of sending it up, saying, you know, I'm here, I'm in the middle of nowhere, I don't have a phone. All I know is things are blowing up all over the place, and people need to know what's going on. He would set up his equipment, start speaking, deliver his report, and then like a week later, find out if any of it had actually ever gone out. And sometimes we captured what he sent, and sometimes we didn't. Um, but that's the kind of people we have working for us. And so uh, you can't avoid the situations where sometimes you have to rely on other sources. But uh, we, we as an organization try to always either see it ourselves or find out from multiple people what happened. So that's the best we can do. Uh, hi there. First of all, thank you very much for being here. My name is David. I'm from London, and I'm an intern here at the ITD. Um, this is kind of an addendum to the previous question, uh, and it relates to social media. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to draw back an example which I experienced, mm. which was during the London riots. You know, I was in London. There was very little kind of solid information coming from the press, purely because well, a journalists often were too scared to go into these places, and you saw certain reports of journalists having their cameras and things stolen by all the rioters and looters. <laughs> And what have you. Um, so a lot of my friends actually turned to typing in on, say, Twitter, riots in Ealing or mm -hmm. Hackney or whatever, um, and they could get a lot, of, a lot of information from that. Sure, you know, a lot of it was unverifiable, but when you've got four or five or ten people saying the same thing, you know, there's got to be some truth to it. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what the kind of rapid growth of Facebook and Twitter and the like, as well as the ease with which you can find you know, articles from two or three minutes ago on Google, if you type it in straight away, you get, you know, the top three results and you can refresh that and it'll probably be completely new stories the next minute. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what kind of impact has that had on your programming and reporting? Um, it's had a number of impacts. Uh, first off, we have the ability to, to interact and respond with people, gather potential sources in ways we haven't in the past. Um, even on things that aren't breaking news stories, um, uh, the uh, uh, we can find people who have if we're like if we're doing a story about um, like a, a locals. This isn't even NPR. Or one of our local stations did recently did a series of reports about um, teen, uh, kids who don't finish school. What happens to them as adults who are, who are basically functionally illiterate um, as adults in the United States? What is their life like? And in order to find some of those people. We had to go to very untraditional sources to find them, or to ask, or people who had relatives, like an uncle who didn't didn't know how to read, um, uh, how we would find those people. We turned a lot of social media to 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 do that. Um, we have an ongoing experiment with social media now, which is um, which is which is kind of amazing. A gentleman named Andy Carvin who works for us. If you ever follow him at Andy Carvin, he's 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 a, a god in the Twitter universe. He spent basically during the uh, Egyptian Revolution. He spent days funneling through tweets and retweeting stuff. Um, and uh, it was both controversial in I think it was, uh, thousands of tweets he sent out. Um, and it was controversial for a number of reasons because he obviously, in that kind of being that funnel for information, was repeating things that later proved to be inaccurate. But he also was, and in real time, kind of documenting in 140 characters that revolution occurring. And uh, he actually wrote a book about his experience in that, during that week called Distant, Wit Wis Distant Witness. If you'd like to look it up, uh, even follow him on Twitter. I, guarantee, I didn't have a chance to check with him yesterday, but I guarantee for the minute that, that Boston Marathon uh, uh, story broke, he was gathering together sources, both institutional sources like the fire department, police department, the marathon itself, along with people on the ground there 
and uh, and what people were experiencing themselves. It's actually a fascinating way to experience a story. Um, you may have heard of Hurricane Sandy, which affected the United States this past. Um, that was my first experience with this personally. Um, my family vacations in a uh, uh, in the summer um, on an island off of the coast of New Jersey, just south of New York City. Uh, called Long Beach Island, which was uh, almost directly hit by Hurricane Sandy. Because it is, there's not a newspaper there, there's not a radio station there, there's not a TV station there. Philadelphia is about an hour and change drive away. The way that I found out about everything, including finding a picture of the house, was on Twitter. And I was able to follow it for days. Uh, the store down the street where we always go had been flooded. Um, you know, the uh, there's a uh, there was unfortunately stories at one time about a, a Ferris wheel that's there on the island. Someone had had been reporting and it was repeated on Twitter a number of times that the Ferris wheel had come loose and had rolled into the ocean. Uh, it wasn't true, but uh, it was it was it, and there was unfortunately a lot of pictures of sharks swimming around next to people's. Uh, in the water as it rose up on the street, which was completely photoshopped. So you have to deal with that kind of stuff. But if you go into that with a skeptic's eye of saying, I know there are things here that are gonna be repeated that are untrue, but as I look at the whole of it, the information I'm receiving, it's a new way to, uh, to uh, experience information and to, to a, a new form of journalism, in a sense, kind of crowdsourced journalism. Um, uh, it isn't always going to be right, but it's in many times it can provide you with specific information you need in a way traditional broadcast media will never be able to do. Other questions? Additional questions, comments? Maybe then let me pose the final question, just a little bit related to cultural diplomacy, uh, in particular in terms of Twitter. Uh, we have on our board of directors Ambassador Cynthia Schneider. I'm not sure if you know of her, Professor at Georgetown, former American ambassador. She has the thesis that the future of cultural diplomacy is going to be much more about listening than speaking. Uh, and mm -hmm. as you look at, let's say, what the State Department was doing with Egypt before the Arab Spring, they were busy writing on Facebook pages. They were they were busy publishing their Facebook pages. They weren't reading Facebook pages. They mm -hmm. weren't reading the tweets. They weren't the mm -hmm. tweets. They weren't listening to the music. So I was just curious, as you're coming from the the field of the media, how would you see, let's say, the future of culture diplomacy? Would you also see an opportunity for this idea of a culture diplomacy about input? And what role can journalism, uh, or what role can a media organization like NPR play uh, in that process, let's say, of this, this culture diplomacy about intake? Well, the, the, the fourth estate uh, journalism is, uh, as Thomas Jefferson said, essential for, for democracy and for uh, civic uh, participation in, in culture and life. Uh, it is so. I think we look at our role as being fairly essential in in uh, helping people understand each other um, and able to uh, communicate. And like I said, when you remove that visual reference and you have the ability to hear someone's story, you realize that the difference, in, which may be many miles or many life experiences, but you know people still love each other. They still care about their families. They still want to leave a better life and to to to. To, to for the efforts for their own efforts to result in in their world or community being a better place, and that doesn't matter where you are. That's kind of a shared universal thing. And hearing someone's life story on the radio make can help you understand. You know, even I um, am reminded by that almost daily about uh, about uh, uh, the human condition and the and the importance of always kind of keeping your eye on understanding the experience of others. So I think that really plays into that quite handily. Um, it's interesting when you talk about listening back because I think that one of the things that NPR prides itself on is listening. However, even an organization like us um, needs to challenge ourselves because uh, it's very easy to send out a, a Twitter feed or a Facebook page and for it to be a one-way communication, and they always fail. They, you know, one of the things that we, we were experimenting around with several of our new programs that we were developing, and of course, when we're, we have them on whiteboards and we're talking about them, we're thinking, oh, we need to have a social media presence and a digital presence. But one of the things we learned after we had started these new shows and, um, and been doing some audience surveying is people were frustrated because we were sending all this information out, but it wasn't obvious that we were paying attention. You know, you know, people talk about in relationships, active listening, where you listen to a spouse or a partner and you, you say back to them, okay, what I hear you saying is these things and how you communicate in a relationship. Uh, uh, oddly, a, a, a digital relationship with an audience or, or any kind of contingency that you're speaking to, it's important that they know that you're hearing all these things that are happening. So uh, NPR tries to be very responsive to people and to be responsive to, to stories. And 
you know, it, it tends to be a, a journalism tends to hold itself pretty high in a pedestal that we are the we have the ability to see things clearly and objectively and apply fairness to the situation and then we'll tell you what it is and it's a very different paradigm these days for us to realize that we're not standing up here we're standing right down whoa standing right down with everybody else and we have to consider them as our equals and and for traditional journalism journalists that's very difficult to, to achieve but it's definitely the direction that our entire industry is heading not just NPR no, I think the same lesson can be applied for culture diplomacy in the sense humility, uh, recognizing mm -hmm. our own imperfection and the fact even though we want to find out the truth of, you know, were yeah. there really sharks there next to the Ferris wheel, yeah. we're never going to actually get the absolute truth. And I think the journalist's yeah. job is to try to come as close as possible. So I think a valuable awesome. lesson also that can be applied to the cultural diplomat. Yeah. Uh, but on that note, I would like to ask everyone to please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude to Mr. Eric Newsom for an excellent presentation as well as the discussion that followed.